It is so wonderful to see you all here tonight. Our main passage for this evening is John 1, 38 through 42. John 1, 38 through 42. We are nearing the end of chapter 1. John 1, 38 through 42. While you're turning there, would anybody like to share anything that they have learned up to this point? Big or small, it doesn't matter, popcorn time. Just kind of a short review. Remember, last Wednesday we spoke a little bit about the significance of baptism. Um, Jesus being baptized, we spoke about why Jesus was baptized, what that meant for the church, and... uh, Specifically, some of the tenets of baptism, how baptism is a, it's a New Testament concept, but it has Old Testament roots. Remember, we talked about how when the Old Testament, the, the warrior, was covered in leprosy, he went to Elisha, and Elisha told him to just go be clean, to go wash, to go wash in the river. Very simple command, and in fact, it was so simple that that warrior was frustrated. He thought that he was going to get some, you know, be, be, been told to do some grand thing, but instead it was quite simple, just go and be clean. And in truth, that points to the gospel message. The gospel message is fairly, it's profound, but it's simple. The gospel message is not asking you to, do, to go do some grand thing. It's not asking you to go exercise some grand principle. It is simply a command to be clean and let Jesus do the washing. You understand? When Jesus saved the thief on the cross, the thief on the cross didn't, know, didn't even know the word soteriology. The thief on the cross probably had very limited, very little theological grasp. And yet, the thief on the cross was with Jesus that day. That is how simple it is. And so sometimes we can overcomplicate it to make it more grand, to make it more hyper-spiritual than it actually is. Even though it is profound, it is simple. And so where we're at today, we're skipping ahead a little bit because we've already talked about some of this, but we're in John 1, verses 38 through 42. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, or in the Aramaic it's Kepha, which is translated Peter. Let's pray. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for having Jonathan lead us through worship, God. And I pray now as we come to the study of your word, Father, that the Holy Spirit would so guide us, would keep us awake and attentive, Father, and would enlighten our minds to the truth and the revelation that is in your word, God. I pray that we would come to a proper interpretation so that your word may enrich our lives and our mind and our soul, God, so that we be better stewards of this life that you have given us and to be better evangelists as we go out and proclaim the truth of the word of God, the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would be with us now. We thank you so much for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, I pray that you forgive me of mine. Be with us now, God, as we come to your word. And in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So in verse 38, And Jesus turned and saw them following. Who's them? Well, you go back to 35, 36, and 37, and it's two disciples that were following John, John the Baptist. And so, remember, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming and says, Behold, behold the Lamb, behold Jesus. 
and the two disciples go and they leave John to follow Jesus. And we talked about that. That is a good part for John. John is not jealous. John is not jealous to try to hold on to those disciples. The one whom he's preached about up to that point is here. And so the two disciples are leaving John to go and follow Jesus. And they are literally following him. And Jesus turned and saw them and said to them, What is it that you seek? Or what do you seek? What a very profound question and a very profound moment. Because remember, Jesus is not just some other man. He is not finite in the sense that we are finite. Jesus knows, and we go on in John chapter 2, we read that Jesus knows what is in man. He knows man's intentions. He knows man's thoughts. And yet, Jesus still turns around and he looks at these two people following him and says, what do you seek? If we don't take a moment to pause to reflect as to what exactly Jesus is asking them and why he is asking them, we might miss something that's very important. Questions like this should cause us to reflect on other times throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, when God asked questions that he already knew the answer to. What I find so interesting is that God is, is, a, he is an omnipotent, omniscient being. He knows all things. And yet, as you read through the Old Testament, God is quite the inquisitor. He asks a lot of questions. Why? Does God have some kind of gap in his knowledge that he's trying to bridge with the people that he's communicating with? Does he not know their intention? Does he not know why they are sinning? Historically, whenever God asks a question, they aren't for his benefit. There's really four questions. Four questions that I kind of want to look at just for a moment. In Ezekiel 37.3, God, God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? Now, judging off that question, you ought to know what I'm talking about, and it's the valley of dry bones. God looks at Ezekiel, who has seen this valley of dry bones, and the, the imagery here is that there, it's the valley with a vast number of people who are not just dead, but they are dead. And they have been dead for a long time. That all the flesh, all the sinew, everything has come off of their body. And their bones aren't even, don't have an inch of moisture anymore. They are just dry. So these people have been dead for a long time. And so God looks at Ezekiel and says, can these bones live? Is God trying to collect some information from Ezekiel? Does God not know the extent of his own power? Not at all. God is trying to make Ezekiel reflect on his power. And Ezekiel does. We see his answer in the same verse. Ezekiel says, my Lord, you know. In other words, my Lord, you know that they can live. So God is not trying to ascertain some, some information from Ezekiel. In Exodus 14, 15, God said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? The people of Israel are grumbling heavily against Moses because they've been led out, but they're hungry, and they're tired, and they're thirsty. And so they're grumbling against Moses, and they're crying out to God. And God says, Why are you crying out to me? Is God trying to collect some information from them? Does God actually not know the reason? Does God not know that they're hungry? Does God not know that they're thirsty? Does God not know that they are now in the wilderness? No, he does know. He's God. And yet he asks them anyway, why do you cry out to me? Two very significant questions, probably some, one of the most, two of the most significant questions in the Bible are in the first few chapters of Genesis. In Genesis 4, 9, God asks Cain, he says, where is Abel, your brother? Does God not know that Cain killed Abel? Is God in interrogating Cain to get some information that he doesn't have? No, 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 no. God is asking Cain to cause Cain to reflect on what it is that he has done. 
How often do we do something wrong and then we just want to forget about it? We want to push it outside of our memories. But God is bringing that to the forefront of Cain's mind, and Cain's irritated. We see that in his response. Am I my brother's keeper? But even before that, the saddest question, in Genesis 3.9, God asks Adam, where are you? Has God lost his sight? He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Does God really not know where Adam is? Of course not. But by asking, God is causing Adam to reflect on what he has done. That because he sinned, he is now separated from God. So, and uh, these are just four, but I promise you, when you read through the scriptures, you find God asks a lot of questions, but none of them are for his benefit. According to a website called psychologydictionary.org by a master in in social psychology, N. Sam, probing questions, and that's what this is, probing questions are direct questions to stimulate further discussion. To quote, it says, the technique is used to uncover important information relevant to the subject, not to the questioner. Probing questions are for the benefit of the subject, to cause information to come out of the subject, or to facilitate the subject in coming to a realization about themselves or their condition. You know, we've seen this joke, uh, I I don't say it's a joke, but we've seen it a lot of times on uh, movies where somebody's in a psychologist's office, and the psychologist doesn't say anything. And the person comes to the realization of what's wrong just by talking to the psychologist. Have you ever seen something like that? It's usually pretty humorous. But it's true. The psychologist will ask questions, but the questions are not for the psychologist's benefit. It's for the benefit of the one answering, for them to come to the realization. So God knows the answers to all of the questions that he asks, but by asking them, he's forcing man to pause and reflect. And usually it's on two key points, on man's iniquity and on his unfailing power and mercy. These are usually the two reasons why God asks a question, so that we pause and reflect on those things. So when Jesus asked the disciples of John, what are they seeking? He already knows the answer. So why then does he ask them? Well, their answer was simple enough. Here's the one that John had been telling them about. Here's the one that John had said was the Messiah. And so when they see him, they are filled with wonder and perplexity. If this is the Messiah, if this is the one that John has been testifying to us about, I want to go see him. I want to go see what the big deal is. I want to go see and know him like John sees and knows him. And so they're coming up to Jesus. They wanted to abide with him. They wanted to be with him. They desired him. And yet I wonder if this moment, this seemingly simple and insignificant moment, ever popped back into their heads at later points in history. Such as in Luke 14, 25-35, when Jesus lists the costs of discipleship. Luke 14, 25-35 says this, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? 
Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and he is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but if it is... But if the salt has become tasteless, what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. That's a very hard teaching. Jesus looks at these people who's been following him, these people that have witnessed his, his miracles and heard him teach. And, you know, albeit Jesus is a very stern, but he is a very kind man. And yet Jesus looks at the people following him and says, if you're not willing to hate your mother and your father and your wife and your brothers and your sisters, you're not fit to be my disciple. What's worse than that is he says, if you're not willing to carry your cross, you are not able to be my disciple. Now keep in mind, Christians, to us, the cross is a symbol of hope. That is what is coming to our heads when we envision the cross. We envision redemption and atonement. But at this time, the cross was no such thing. The cross was not a symbol of hope. In fact, the cross was such a cruel form of punishment by the Romans that it was reserved for their highest criminals and usually was not allowed to be used on Roman citizens. The cross, the crucifixion, was so painful a death and so humiliating a death that it was reserved only for the highest of criminals in the Roman province. And yet Jesus is looking at these people and saying, if you're not willing to carry a cross, you're not fit to be my disciples. I wonder if this memory popped into Andrew's head. What do you seek? Surely Andrew wasn't seeking to carry a cross. Neither was he seeking to hate his mother or his father or his brothers or his sisters. And yet we have this moment. Folks, but it's imperative that we understand something. No greater love or peace could one find than trusting in the truths that Jesus had given him. I know it's hard for us to see in this life, but there is no greater, there is no paramount of peace and comfort and love that we could ever know if we are not first willing to forego the world and our very lives. In fact, don't we spend so much of our time worrying about the things of this world and our very lives? Don't those things cause us stress? Heartache, discomfort. And Jesus, we can look at it this way, that Jesus is saying that you must do all of these things, but in another way he's saying, give them to me. The cost of discipleship. What do you seek? Because if you seek to save your own life, you'll lose it. Any questions so far? Forsaking the world, even his own body, for the one who could restore him to his God. No greater arms of peace or comfort could he find. No greater assurance could he find. Said to him, Rabbi, which translates, translated means teacher. By the way, and those little uh, things that are within the parentheses, those are actually there. Those aren't add-ins. Uh, John actually added those into the text. And it's because of what we talked about in the first couple Wednesdays here that John is speaking to a predominantly 
Hellenistic Jewish audience, a people who is more accustomed to Gentile practices and more accustomed to pagan practices than they are to Jewish practices. So he's, he's going through the process of explaining things to them. Luke does this as well, and Luke does it very well. Luke, Luke does it more so than John um, because Luke's audience is predominantly pagans, is predominantly Gentiles. So John is actually taking the time to explain things to them. So those things that you see in parentheses, they're actually there. They're in the Greek text. <clears throat> it says in verse 39, As he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. The tenth hour was about 4 p.m. Jewish time. So, you know, it's time for supper. After that, maybe a little bit of conversation, and then lights out. The sun goes down. It's time for bed. But I want us to pay attention to Andrew's first act. So the two disciples um, that were coming from John to Jesus, we know one of them is Andrew because it said so in the text. Uh, historians and theologians generally agree that the second one is John, the author of this book, John the Apostle. And you remember we talked about how John doesn't really name or allude to himself in either his epistles or his gospel. And so this would be an example of that. Um, but we know one of them is Andrew, and Andrew is the brother of Peter, who was first called Simon. Peter is the Greek translation of his new name. What was Andrew's first act after meeting and abiding with Jesus? He went and told his brother. That was his first act. And if we just glance over that, if we just skim over it, we miss how profound that is. Here is, here is Andrew who has stayed all night with Jesus the Messiah and the next day he gets up and the first thing, the first person that he thinks of is his family, his brother. And so he runs and goes and tells his brother, and he says, Brother, we have found the Messiah. He first found his own brother, in verse 41, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah. Now, we can only speculate as to why he did that. But I think that we can have fairly strong speculations to say that he went to his brothers first, out of an act of loving loyalty to his family. He had a good relationship with his brother, Simon. And since he found the one that can save everybody, since he found the one that is going to save the world, according to the Jews, was going to deliver them from their afflictions, why would he keep that from his brother? Why would he keep that from his family? He wouldn't. And so he runs and he goes and tells Peter, and Peter meets Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated to Peter. But Andrew thought of his brother first. And you know, when I read this, I thought about something that we do, and I understand why we do it, but I just I think about how incredibly sad it is. Usually, today, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or if you haven't noticed this, when people come to Christ, the last people they tell is their family. The last people they tell. And I'll tell you why. When people come to Christ, they're excited. They have what's called being on fire for the Lord. I'm sure we've heard that. And they would go and tell everybody about Jesus that they could find. They would go to the farthest sides of the world. Tell people whose language they didn't even speak about Jesus. And yet, they wouldn't face their own family. Their own brothers, their sisters, their father, their mother. And I'm referring to predominantly an unbelieving household. And I'm thinking about why that is. And Jesus experienced this in John 7, 5. I didn't give it to you, so don't look for it. In John 7, 5, it says that Jesus' own brothers reject him. So here is Jesus pulling out all of these strangers to be his disciples. He's preaching to these people who are strangers to him, 
physically, and yet his own family, who was raised with him, rejects him. Why? Because they knew him. Even though Jesus never sinned, they knew him. They saw, they, they saw him when he was a kid. They knew that he was somebody that once had to have his diaper changed. They saw him play. They saw him have fun. And suddenly the fun has stopped, and he's no longer, he's no longer their fun brother. He's the Messiah. And folks, so often that we are afraid to go to our familiars, and I use the term family, but family and friends, we are so afraid to go to our familiars for the simple reason they know us. They know what we've done. They know who we are. They were raised with us. Many of them we have a really good relationship with, and we don't, we don't want to mess that up. We don't want to be outcast. Or we don't want to push them away. And in our minds, we're thinking, there's no way that they're going to listen to me talk about redemption and atonement when they know the things that I've done. They did them with me. Just last week, just last week, me, my brothers, and my sisters, we all went to the bar together and got drunk. And now, now I'm supposed to come to them and tell them about the Savior of the world? But folks, and listen to me, there's nobody that needs to hear it more than your family. And there's nobody whose responsibility and allegiance you owe more to than your family. Now, I don't want to ask anybody to raise their hands, but how many of you have family members that you know if they died today, they would be burning for eternity in hell? How many of your family members do you know that if they died today, you would never see them again and they would never know the grace of God. And how many opportunities have you been given as their sibling to tell them the truth of the gospel and you have not because you've been afraid of what they might think. You're afraid of separating from them. You're afraid of them casting you out or you're afraid of pushing them away. Listen, if that person is genuinely an unbeliever, you're going to be separated from them for eternity anyway. The question is, is now, today, while they are alive, you have the chance, you have the hope to give them. You have the chance to share with them the gospel of eternal life. You have the chance to show them the profoundness and yet the simplicity of being forgiven, of shedding off the weight of sins and sorrows and coming into a loving relationship with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit and with His church, His bride, who encourage one another and build one another up and love on one another. You have the opportunity to do that today. Don't let the fear of separation prevent you from sharing the gospel with your family because if they really are unbelievers, you will be separated from them someday. The question is not about someday. The question is, what are you going to do today? I love Andrew's zeal for his family. The first thing he does is go to his brother and says, Brother, I have found the Messiah. I found him. What if we were just that excited? What if we were just that excited about sharing the gospel that we went to the people that we knew, that we loved, that we grew up with, and we had something that we knew was precious, something that we knew was holy, something that we knew was valuable, and instead of keeping it to ourselves, we went and we shared it with everybody that we could, especially our family. What if we knew just how precious the gospel is? What if we knew just how precious and powerful our Lord is? If we reflected on that, would we maybe be just a little more excited about going and sharing the gospel and maybe just a little less afraid? I encourage you, and this is my charge for you, 
to love your families by loving Jesus first. And tell the ones that you love about Christ. Okay. Before we move on, do we have any questions or anything about that? I was noticing that Jesus asked them what you see. They responded with their own words. Hmm. Yeah. Well, they, especially at this time, they would not know the dramatic implications of the Messiah. And in their Jewish mind, the Messiah was going to deliver them from their earthly afflictions. And so it wasn't until much later that they actually realized that the Messiah is forgiveness from sins, not deliverance from Rome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were. They were absolutely still feeling him out. You know, you, you've got to imagine, especially at this time, I want you all to know that there were quite a few in Jesus' day messiahs. There were several people who called themselves messiahs in Jesus' time. And so there, there might have been some skepticism there, wondering, is this just another one of those falsities it's just, just another one of those flukes and so they come to Jesus and but something about Jesus caused them to follow him you know and we know today that that was the drawing that was the drawing of the Holy Spirit in this next section or in this this last part we're going to talk about today Jesus looks at Simon and he renames him who does that he looks at Simon and he says, No longer are you Simon, you shall be called Cephas. In the Aramaic, it's Kepha. And then John has so wonderfully told us what it is in the Greek, and Kepha translated in the Greek is, is Peter or Petrus. And both of those things, Kepha and Petrus, mean rock. Okay? So he looks at Peter and he renames him rock, essentially. And if we didn't know what the word rock is, and I come up to you and I say, you know, no longer is your name John, I'm going to name you Rock. You'd probably think I was a little nutty. And yet that's exactly what Jesus does here. Why does he rename Peter? It doesn't really explicitly tell us in the Bible. But if we go back and we look at some Old Testament accounts going all the way back to Genesis, we find that when somebody names something or a thing, they have authority over that thing. They have dominion over that thing. All the way back in, in Genesis, uh, God gives dominion of the earth and of the animals over to Adam and Eve. And what is the first thing he tells Adam to do? To name them. Naming something was a sign of authority. And so Jesus, by coming up to Peter, this is his first time meeting Peter, and he looks at Peter and says, no longer are you Simon, but I'm going to name you Cephas. He is exercising some kind of authority. In other words, he's saying, Peter, you are mine. Peter, you are mine. He does the same thing, of course, with Paul, too. Remember, Paul used to be named Saul, but then when Paul was saved, he became Paul. John, and I've already pointed this out, but he, he goes on to explain that in the text. In Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18, we read an interesting exchange. Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18. Why does Jesus rename Simon to Cephas? Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, we have to be very careful when we're reading this passage 
because a lot of very predominant denominations get it wrong as to what exactly Jesus is saying this rock. A lot of people have built it up that when Jesus says, upon this rock I will build the church, that he's talking to Peter. Peter in the Greek is Petros. Okay? But that word, that rock that he's using there is, he's referred it back to the feminine Petrus. So not Petros, but Petrus. But the indication of what Jesus is talking about here is not the person of Peter because he's using this, this neutral adjective, this rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church. It's actually an alluance back to the confession that Peter made. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then, of course, Jesus says, you did not receive this from yourself. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave it to you. And upon this rock, you are Peter, and, and his name means rock, but upon this rock I'll build my church. Why is Peter named rock? Because he was the first to make the gospel profession of faith, that Jesus is the Messiah. Upon this rock I will build my church, not Peter. This is, this is why so many think that Peter was the first pope, because it was upon him that the rest of the church was built. But when we go on and we read through the scriptures, we find, and uh, I, I, I encourage you to check behind me on this, Peter did not have any kind of special authority. Each of the disciples had authority within their own realm. In fact, we read Paul in Galatians quite sternly rebukes Peter to his face. So it was quite plain that Peter did not have any kind of special authority over the church. He wasn't some kind of first pope. It is not upon Peter, it is not upon man, it is not upon the liturgy that Christ is going to build his church. It is upon the gospel, the belief that he is Lord, that he is the Messiah. That is the rock. The gospel is the rock. The confession is the rock, not Peter. Do you understand? Well, that is all that I have got for y'all today. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns? All right.